Hold on, I'm gonna be right back. still people coming in, but I think I'm going to start now. Thank you for joining us to the virtual readings and artist talk on the topic of booty roots. Uh, we're joined by John, um, Jonathan Chan, Kyung Yi Kim, and Yoon Soo Jung. And this is actually being recorded currently for the RSVP'd guests on the Eventbrite. Uh, my name is Andre Lee Basue. I'll be moderating our talk. Um, I specifically curated this artist book. Roots, Korean Diaspora. Um, last year was as many diverse Korean American writers, poets, and artists with the theme of roots. And so this is a collaborative artist book that's currently on view at the Aborn Gallery um, of AS220 in Providence, Rhode Island. So it's as well as a group exhibition of original artwork from the artists participating. So the first guest that we're introducing tonight is Yoon Soo Jung. Yoon Soo Jung is a Los Angeles Korean based Korean American artist and born in South Korea. She immigrated to San Francisco at age 13. After attending the animation illustration program at San Jose State University, she headed down to Los Angeles to pursue her career in the animation industry. She has been working as a color artist for multiple projects at Nickelodeon Animation Studios and DreamWorks TV. So her miniature materials often include recycled materials, scraps, and found objects where she finds the imperfection and gritty nature of the materials. So Yunsu contributed page um, 55 and 59 of this artist book. I know I have the blurred background here, but I'll try to like know what I should take out. The, oops, sorry guys. I'm not sure. Well, anyway, we'll actually, we'll let Yoon Soo take over now and share her um, presentation, and she can talk more about what she actually contributed to the book. <laughs> Thank you, Andre. Um, I'm going to share screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yoon Soo, and this is my short presentation of the specific to the piece. Um, can everyone see it? Listening thumbs up. Okay. So I was really inspired by this Korean minhwa, um, type of minhwa called Bumbangdo. Um, they're also called Chekgori. And they are specifically um, focused on like scholastic like items like books and paintings um, that features sometimes instruments and flowers. Sorry. Um, so I really wanted to make my version of Bumbangdo and I was really inspired by these objects because I, I'm always so fascinated with small items that means a lot to me. And as you can see on the left, on the right side in Spo, this is like the type of a Korean traditional furniture that has a mother of the pearl decoration. So um, I kind of wanted to combine these two ideas. The so initial idea was this um, kind of simple, um, some of the items that has been kind of reoccurring and meaningful to me. Um, I've dived into my Korean American history research on my own project a couple of years ago, and I've been wanting to kind of memorate those um, specific moments. So you can kind of see my work in progress of building a shelf. Uh, the shelves are made of wood scraps um, and different type of wood. So whatever I could find, I'll just um, cut them out and make make a make a shape of it. Um, it's not the exact shape as my initial sketches. Um, it happens a lot of times where I have a vision, but it just doesn't feel right as I build. So I decided to go a more simpler route and kind of decided to space out things a little bit better. 
This is a close-up items of each individual piece that was in the sculpture. Um, pineapple uh, signifies the first Korean American immigrants who came here as a pineapple farmers in Hawaii. And I wanted to look at the photo of the, the ship that they write in. So I wanted to add that to the shelf. These are some of the spicy items, the food items that I really loved and craved when I first came to United States. Um, I started learning more about the 1992 LA uprising. This was a more, it's commonly known as the LA riots. And it's, uh, I, it's something that I didn't know about until I came down to LA. And it's, um, it's learning process for me to understand the complexity of this uh, event. And as I learned, I wanted to commemorate that. Um, the items below that TV is the some of the items that I brought from Korea uh, and the ones that I couldn't live without until I graduated the college, which was the Texas, um, the weird calculus <laughs> uh, the calculator and the Korean American dictionary and animation pencil and a diploma paper. Some of the books that I chose specifically for this project was the books that I've read during um, pandemic and that I just kept continuing to read about. Um, those are the Korean American books that I've read and still ongoing on the list. And of course, my childhood memory of this uh, animation character, Tuli. It's something that I grew up watching and the soju, just because I love soju. So these are the miniature size of like mixed items that I cherish and I decided to put it in the shelf. Um, I had this idea of adding some kind of color in the back and the shelf. So me and Andre kind of did like a back and forth of like, what do you feel about this? And how do we feel about this? And I just really love this like visual graphic um, look of this red. And we were kind of bouncing off the idea and Andre suggested, what if we just cut out of the shelf on the page of the book? So have the red in the back and have the item separately picked photograph. So it was a kind of a collaborative project. And it was my first time having someone who professionally done the book to give this idea back and forth, which was really uh, amazing for me. So what I provided for Andre was separate um, images that were just the shelf itself. Um, and so they can cut out easily around the shelf items. And then the floating items uh, separately, which required a lot of a photoshopping and cleaning out some of the items as it is. Um, so that was that. Um, I also wanted to show some of the other uh, miniatures work I've done. That includes like and celebrates my own version of like traditional things. And um, this Hanyakbang piece on the left is the um, traditional herbal medicine kind of pharmacy. But I wanted to include like a more modern Asian, East Asian um, medicines that I've lived with <laughs> that I thoroughly believe in. Uh, so I wanted to celebrate that with the traditional thing in the background. So that was one of the projects I've done. Uh, this was a Chuseok, uh, like a Myeongjur holiday um, scene that I wanted to depict. And it reminded me of my, how we celebrated our grandfathers and grandmothers um, from making these miniatures. And there's like a whole orderly of uh, where they put and whatnot, but it's, I don't want to get into that, uh, but this is another uh, project I've done. And lastly, these are some of the other projects I've uh, worked on. Similar to the shelf idea, I wanted to focus on uh, what these objects means to me, and I love to place them in a way that makes sense to me. So um, these two projects were spicy project, which was spicy objects, and the spicy and sweet project that re that reminds me of my childhood. So those are some of my artworks. And I believe that concludes my short presentation. Thank you, Yunzu. I had some questions for you. And everyone is um, welcome to type any questions for Yunzu, um, as well as after all the artists and writers 
um, share their work, they can, um, we can also have a discussion afterwards and everyone can turn on their cameras and join in as well. Um, oh yeah, but before I go, I did, I did fix my camera a little bit to be able to have it focus because I know I had a blurred background before. So this is the page in um, Yunzu's um, project in book form. So basically we collaborated, we decided um, to print it on a layer of transparency, the objects, and then a layer of translucent vellum of the bookcase, and then red paper behind to get that layered look. But um, yeah, I wanted to ask you how you were, um, did you say, did you explain how you were exposed to the Mungbangdo paintings or you grew up with them in your home or? I didn't particularly grow up with the Mumbangdo paintings or anything, but I've seen them a lot because um, I, you know, my ha like more than half of my life education was from Korea. So it was very like accessible to see Korean traditional paintings in textbooks or the museums or all this like um, historical um, items. And I've really been drawn to the type of paintings that depicted like more like a daily life of the old time, um, rather than, uh, I don't know, abstract paintings or portraiture. So I just, I've, I've been always been fascinated by the still life because that represents that their lifestyle of that per time period. So I love that idea of a Mumbang Dome. I know. I and mean, it fits kind of perfectly with what your art practice is, you know, your little mini sculptures and um, oh, I, we do have a question on the chat. It says, Maya asks, I would love to know what book titles you included on the shelves, if you have a list. Yeah, um, I have tons of lists that are ongoing, um, but to name a few is H, uh, Crying in H Mart, uh, Pachinko. There was a really good book called Wake Up by written by a Korean American educator. Um, so I added that, uh, DMZ Colony. Um, I believe Dick T, um, Minor Feelings. Um, it's been a long project that I want to continue to grow and I would love to put it in somewhere with the list of the books that I've been reading. Um, and which is kind of funny that I started reading more Korean American books or written by Asian American writers in general since pandemic. And it kind of surprised me how much, how little I knew or read before this time, because it was never, I don't know, it never, like I never initiated it or it was never included in summer reading programs growing up or it was never like a prioritize. And now that I'm doing more identity search and my own search of my work, I feel like it's necessary for me to educate myself on this matter. So I've been kind of slowly, but surely reading the books. I don't think the Korean American writers were um, very well known or just not as exposed until the recently, the last few years, because I feel like I have started reading more Korean American writers in the, you know, since the pandemic as well. I don't know if any of the writers can chime in about that, but um, how did you get started with, um, oh yeah, one more, sorry, I'm, I'm the one asking all these questions. Here, but <laughs> I realized all these sculptures that you make, because um, I noticed that it was not for sale at the gallery at the Aborn, are all they just very personal and you don't usually put them up for sale? Um, I have done some sales, um, but specifically that, I think that I honestly love the way the pre project grew, but that particular piece I didn't want it to sell because I feel like I, I wanted to um, kind of move more, do more than that. I wanted to have a, like a like a blueprint of a bigger project of what it was. So that particular piece I just it just felt like oh I didn't want to part it. <laughs> um, but definitely some of the spices um, pieces sold. And one of the pieces that I has uh, showed. Um, was part of the KASD auction item. So I definitely have put some auction items for raising of funds for specific um, reasons. Oh, I see. So it's sort of like kind of an artist proof in a way, like you're going to expand on that project and make something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the Chuseok piece was the holiday at the 
she was like, pay one. Actually, my husband bought it for the first time oh. uh, at the event. So, <laughs> well, I'm glad that we did it. you bought it. So we have it at home. <laughs> it's hard to depart some of the items because I always feel like I want to do more uh, series of the work. I'm planning to do traditional wedding ceremony, like a plate oh. or like the, the you know, toljabi, like when they turn. Uh, mm -hmm. one the little small items so I wanted to like create like more um, Korean traditional holiday related events and I wanted to keep that um, mm -hmm. series going so I think I'm a little more hesitant to sell those things for now at the moment once I'm done with the project I will just hopefully sell by right. this I know that's it reminds me of a discussion I had with a friend of mine too about how sometimes our artwork is so personal like it's hard to let go. Like <laughs> sometimes you just make it for yourself really. And um, uh, do we have any more other questions for you too? Um, I did have one more question that I had prepared and this is kind of like not related to um, uh, the actual work, but what you had commented on um on the booty account when you you did the IG takeover, I wanted you to explain like what um what kind of examples of how like Korean diasporic folks often feel like when we're living in the times of past Korea. Like, do you have any examples of that? Like, because that kind of that comment kind of like touched me as a person too, as a Korean. American. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think while I was working in a free project, I took a class, online class on comparing two different books um, by a Korean American writer, Dick T and the DMZ um, Colony. So, and then one of the conversation was like the how we translate specific way of our experiences um, doesn't necessarily have to be factual, but like the way that we experience. Um, so the translator may use certain words um, that are very specific to them. And there was one of the conversation, how we feel about what about the people who just immigrated from Korea? Like, how do we like navigate? What is the best way to translate certain phrases and certain written works? And from there, uh, we had an open conversation about how we often feel Korean diasporic um, immigrants and artists feel like part of ourselves, um, the way that we use type of words, our words that we used to use in Korea and describe like our experiences almost kind of stops when we leave Korea. So, so we feel like we know the past Korea and then the Korea is moving without you and while you're living in the United States, almost like as if your experience in your words becomes like fossilized. And I just love that conversation so much about how that's, and that felt like it, it really encapsulated how I've been feeling for the past 30, 30 years. <laughs> um, and that made me feel like I wanted to more explore why I felt that way and how I, Need to how I could celebrate this kind of a state of like I'm not like dead yet in here but I'm still living with the past experiences of Korea and how do I just keep continue to explore that and I think this project and then the class all kind of um, put me in the map where I want to start this bigger exploration and whatnot. Thank you so much for sharing Yunsu. I think we have one more question from Julie Moon. She says, hi, love booty. I have a question for Yunsu about their expert experience about spending more time in Korea as a student as opposed to here in the US. My 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 experiences in Korea, as the, I'm trying to understand the question. My experience about spending more time in Korea as a student opposed to here in the United States. Um, so I went to Korea up to middle school in seventh grade. So um it was very different type of a uh, experience and it was completely upside down because I didn't speak any English and I actually was undocumented immigrant for many years. So um, it's a loaded up like experience because I feel like in Korea, it was like very systematic and in the United States, it was systematic, systematic in different, if different sense. Um, so I felt like it, in school you have like, Instead of like tests and things that I had to focus in Korea, where United States I had to do more than that. <laughs> um, 
the extracurriculums and all that stuff. Uh, so that was a big difference with the experience of being just like text-based studying versus like more than that in the United States. Um, it's more well round. I felt like you have to be a little bit more well-rounded in the United States to survive. Thank you for sharing, Yinsu. Um, I hope that answered Julie's question. And yeah, before we move on to the next um, guest, I wanted to emphasize that we do, we are, Yunsu and I are part of the Korean Artist, um, Korean American Artist Collective, and you are having an event for during the summer, right? The next in July about um, making miniature. Those oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You want to Yes. <laughs> yeah, sure. I totally completely forgot to promote myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'm doing a free, um, like, open to public um, online events of making that miniature books. Um, I think that I'm going to show different type of how to make a miniature books, and I will be providing the PDF format so everyone can just follow along. Um, I can share the link later, but it is basically, like, how to make that small miniature book uh, so you can make your own in the future so yeah i'm gonna be um moderating for your zoom <laughs> in july as well. so yeah if you can drop the link after our chat that'd be great so the next um guest that i'll be introducing will be kyungi kim thank you yunsu and then if you can if you have time we'll try to double back and do a group group discussion um next Writer is Kyungi Kim. Kyungi Kim is a Korean American writer, poet, and educator residing in Michigan. Drawing much from her experience as an immigrant and human being, she explores themes of identity, grief, hope, relationships, and how we can see each other, including ourselves, more clearly with compassion. Being a certified yoga and mindfulness coach, Kyungi is also a mental health and well well being advocate, and this is reflected in her writing as well. Her work has been featured in Shondaland, KoreanAmericanStory.org, Insider, and more. And tonight she'll be reading her poem, Myokguk, that she contributed for the book. And I'll let her take it from here. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you, Andre. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, so I will do my talk and presentation after I read the poem. This poem is called Myokguk. Myokguk. If you were born out of division, I was born out of tomorrow. Your silence carry history before me. You mean protection, I see abandon. I talk between the lines you speak in scripts. I try to wash my heart clean of Korean Han, your soil, your air, only way of loving me. Mother and daughter, this is who we are. When we forget, we go back to the start because in the beginning, we spoke the same. This meal that birthed me into your daughter, that birthed you into a mother. Miyokuk is our birthplace when we forget. Miyokuk is our forgiveness when we can't. Mother and daughter, this is who we are. Strangers who needed each other, out of the sea, this wild creature, unruly, desperately clinging to your warmth while you fed my insides. You nourish my being months on end, a holy ritual. When you soothe me with Kinchana, you mean hope for you and me. Now I see my birth means your death. So I let my heart carry Han while we live in Chang. Amma and Tar, this is who we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gangi. I'm going to share um, your presentation now. Oh, you don't have to put me on the. <laughs> So um, for just in general, I find my inspiration within memories, usually coming from photographs and food. And so with this poem, Miyokguk, um, the photograph that you see here 
the one, um, the one my mom carrying, that's my little sister on her back. My sister's probably three and there I am like five years old, it's in Korea. Um, and then the picture next to that is my grandmother, my mom's mom, who I never really got to know. And so the photos here is related to the miyokguk. So the miyokguk is the seaweed soup, Korean seaweed soup that mothers would eat after they give birth to a child on days and months, many times, several times a day to heal their body from giving birth. And it also provides lots of nutrients and vitamins and minerals that the mother needs in order to uh, carry her child and to stay strong for the child. And so the photographs here, it really reminds me that when I, I don't know about people here, but when I had miyokguk, my mom would always make it on my birthday, even right now, growing up, I hated the taste. It just tasted so sea-like and slimy, and I didn't really like it. But it's once a year that you have to eat this meal in remembrance of your I thought remembrance of your mom's love, it, it, while that's true, it's also to remember her pain and suffering that she went through while giving birth. And so just like miyokguk as something that I saw as bitter, not tasty, something that I didn't desire is very much like my relationship with my mom, where for so long it's been bitter and distant, yet familiar, like this miyokguk. Um, and over time, when we taste something, we taste something to remember, right? I think a lot of times we eat something because we want to remember something or rekindle something. And so over years of eating this miyokguk, it really kind of rekindled a different part of my amma that I never got to really know until I really saw this photograph of my grandmother. My grandmother also had a hard life, did not really bond with her daughter, who is my mom. So there's this generation of suffering, generation of sacrifice, generation of maybe not being there for your child because you have to provide and work really hard. So this thing that bonds us together, like this miyokguk, is also the thing that can hurt us the most too. And so with these images and this meal is where the inspiration of Miyoku came from, which I was trying to express the feelings of both feeling not being heard um, by this person called mother. At the same time, we are bonded forever by this sometimes mysterious, kind of love. So um, Andre, we can go to the next slide there. Thank you. Um, these are also, you know, inspiration for this particular um, poem, but in a broad sense of this booty project. So the picture of my sister and myself, my, my dad taking the picture here, my mom, 1988, as you can see, they're both from 1988. Um, the last trip to, the, I wish I remember where this was, but somewhere in Korea, my mom always loved the water. We never got to go there enough, but she wanted to take us there for one last time before coming to America. My sister and I on, the, on this trip, we didn't know that would be the last time we would be at this um, the sea together. So we're smiling, having a good time. My mom's smiling, but who knows what she's feeling inside there. Um, then we have the immigration photo, but right? you immigrate to the U.S., they take your photo, they take an individual photo and in, I think a family photo as well. That's from October, October 1988. Um, I'm guessing they're kind of a couple months apart. I know you're not really supposed to smile in immigration photo. They want you to kind of look, right, like not smiling at all. For whatever reason, it kind of, to me, it signifies this um, this painful journey that we are about to kind of 
endure, you know, together in, in America. My mom was only 32. I can't believe when I think about how young she was. My sister was six and I was eight years old. Um, yeah, so when I just see the stark difference between the two photos in the same year of us having a good time and smiling and then this immigration photo, again, just another reminder of, to me, sometimes our roots and where we come from it is intertwined with both beauty and hurt and pain. Um, and it is important to express, um, to express both truths. Oh. oh, was I supposed to move to the next slide? <laughs> we can do that. We can do that after. I oh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, do we yeah, want that's to? okay. Yeah, yeah, if people have questions, I um, guess about that's okay, Andre. I'm gonna um, stop sharing because I can't. Oh, wait, I do. Have... Yeah, yeah. You don't have to share that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. No, no. We. Uh. Now I can see the chat. Sorry, my chat box was. Oh, okay. Because I had the full screen, but um, I do have a couple questions for you. Sure. <laughs> Especially yes. Pens. Um. Yeah. When you submitted this poem for the book, um. Mm -hmm the contribution it really touched me and what you spoke about this was actually my first time um I think reading about the expression of Han actually but um and what's coincidental is this year as part of our um next project at the Korean American Artists Collective we're actually um kind of researching um delving deep into the concept of Han um, for our uh, group exhibition coming up in September. So I'm just wondering if you can kind of express more. I mean, I know it's a very difficult concept for everyone <laughs> to understand, but just for the general layman, for, for, for the group talk here, um, what, what your, like personally, what your definition of Han would be. Mm -hmm. It is so, it, it's interesting because it is similar to all Korean people. At the same time, I do feel that it can be individualized as well. So for me, how I would express it is, it's this constant ache, um, this underlining constant ache that I have inside of me, no matter the situation, no matter how happy I am, how joyful, how, and I know that sounds, kind of um, depressing, but it, it is this underlining ache. It's sorrow and resentment, it's anger as well. And I feel that it's these heavy feelings that as Korean people, that we were not, whether we were not allowed to or didn't have the space to, really, we couldn't express. We couldn't express it. And so, but collectively we feel it. You know, so I, I see it as an individual feeling, but collectively, because when we, when I have read other Korean, Korean American, I see, I see their artwork, or I read their writing, I can sense Han, you know, or when we talk about experiences with each other, even if our experiences are similar or different, there is a sense of Han as well. So I don't know, but I do feel like it is unique to the Korean people, this, this longing, this resentment, this anger, this sorrow. I know when you describe it, it sort of like made me like sort of understand my mother more in a way. Cause I feel like, well, I feel like your poem is like kind of the epitome of like what I'm trying to reach with my mother relationship as well. Cause I feel like I haven't gotten there to the end result of your beautiful poem but it's sort of like the communication between us but that feeling of Han I feel it like deeply resonating with her because I think as a um an immigrant but the past history of like the Korean War because she had you know escaped from the north to the south you know in the middle of the war and stuff and just losing her own father and just um just the experience of 
being an immigrant here and just all the hardships that I think immigrants face, maybe I feel like it's more inherent in maybe the diaspora people, you know, like the people who have come to the United States because they come here to like set a better life or something or, you know, to escape um, the third world conditions that was present at the time in the 70s or, you know, and then, um, yeah. So it, your poem really touched me. And also as like, uh, you consider yourself a 1.5 generation Korean American. And um, I kind of identify that as well. Can you explain more about how you see as um, like what, what a 1.5 generation is for people who are not aware of, you know, the differences between a first generation and a second generation? Yeah, so because I came to the US at the age of eight, so a lot of I what I have learned that a lot of our um, memories and our even our personalities and trauma are usually shaped between the ages of zero and six. Those are our primitive years growing up. And so during that point of those primitive years, I was removed from my homeland, right, to America. And although I grew up I had my childhood here at the age of eight all the way on now as you know in my 40s I still feel like this straddle between both worlds you know Korean and American at the same time just kind of like what Unsu shared earlier my memory of Korea is my memory of the 80s <laughs> I, I don't know what it's like you know there perhaps if I were to go in Korea I would feel very American probably. But here, I I don't. I feel Korean, but sometimes I feel less Korean around certain Koreans <laughs> and more American. <laughs> it's very complicated. But but yes, yeah, so I just the straddle between both worlds and having memories of Korea and identifying a lot of the emotions and experiences of what a Korean person have experienced. At the same time, some of my beliefs have been shifted and shaped by the American culture as well and what I do appreciate about the American culture too and so I think the struggle between what part of my Korean identity Korean identity do I sacrifice to be American feels more like me and what do I want because as an immigrant I have realized it's I thought it was all about, okay, what can I take with me from Korea? But it's really been about what can't I take with me? What do I need to leave behind? Which I think is a greater, I don't know, sacrifice and question that I'm still ki kind of, you know, exploring even right now. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but still do feel like I'm living in both cultures, both worlds. Um, even in being in America for 30 plus years. No, I totally get it. Because I mean, well, yeah, I, I consider myself 1.5 generation, even though I was born in America, but I moved to um, Korea from three to nine. And mm -hmm. then I moved to America again at age nine. So very close to your age eight story. Wow. <laughs> but then I spent middle school years in Korea again. So it's just like this back and forth, back and forth straddling. But I totally get how like sometimes you feel more Korean with some more Korean Americans. Yes. But sometimes you feel more American. Like there's so many yes. diverse definition, I think, of Korean American. I think that's what I try to um, portray in the book, um, the collaborative artist book. Oh, I and I, I totally feel that, you know, and I think that's that's why the book is so powerful because we all have different experiences and different ways of expressing that as well. And even when you just said that you came here and then went somewhere and then you came back. So, you know, that's such a different experience than someone who may have grown up here and went back to Korea in later years, maybe. Um, I, I had a comment about what you said about Han because you, Andrew had said that you know, one, you're wondering about if those in the diaspora family feel Han more. It makes me kind of think about, I don't know, I wonder if the, the feeling of Han gets more removed after each generation. 
meaning I'm just thinking about my nephew. It's like, is he going to, I mean, Han is in him because he's <laughs> Korean, but is he going to feel less or have that, have Han be less impact, impacted in his life than, than his mother, which is my sister. And then, I don't know. I mean, I do think it's beautiful that Han transcends generations. Um, because we're kind of carrying our ancestors' grief too, and I do wonder about if it gets removed from generally as we move forward. I guess. I know this is a whole. <laughs> I know it's a whole other. Sorry, I went on a I went on a tangent. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. So yeah, we could discuss more with all the other artists as well. But let's see. Do we have any other questions for Kyungin? If not, um, we can come back for a group discussion about Han. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we'll introduce Jonathan. He's patiently waiting from Singapore here. <laughs> our international guest. Um, Jonathan Chan is a writer, uh, an editor of poems and essays, and born in New York to a Malaysian father and South Korean mother. He was raised in Singapore and educated at Cambridge and Yale universities. He is the author of the poetry collection Going Home from Landmark 2022. Thank you. <laughs> and he has an abiding interest in faith, identity, and creative expression. So Jonathan will be reading his poem, Five Foundings, from his poetry collection, Going Home. And this um, is also published here. And I'll just show a brief, um, oops, that's not, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> meant to unblur my background to share. So this is his um, section here. So I'll take it away. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, for having all of us, for all the love and the care that you've put into uh, pulling this book together. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan. It's a real privilege to be able to join you today to read a poem and to uh, speak a little bit about it. Um, as Andre mentioned, the poem is called Five Foundings, and the title really refers to the fact that my family has had to establish itself in a new place um, sort of five times, or what I identified to be five times that were significant, um, especially in how I understand myself, how I understand the decisions that my ancestors made. Um, my mom is Korean. Um, and yeah, the first portion of the poem traces back to the earliest that I understand uh, of my, the earliest period of which I think my family can trace its origins to. So the furthest back I can understand what it has meant to be Korean for myself and my family. So let me read the poem for you. Five Foundings. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalm 126, verse 6. Soul, 1418. There are quiet miracles along this river. Words are beginning to take shape. The stars are beginning to realign. Letters will nourish the soil. But these circular walls will not always hold. Roaring currents will stir under silk folds, and the roots of this tree will dig not only deep, but wide. Canton to Kuala Lumpur, 1900. These junks come bearing open hands and barren tongues, taking to textures of penciled reports and dusted tracks. Home takes the shape of new mouthfuls and the tingle of blachan, the cool of oil palms and humid gospel halls, but unspoken murmurs cannot stay ignored for long. Over waters they came, and over waters they will go. Seoul to Hong Kong, 1969. There is refuge amidst towering green hills. The trails cross from peninsula to port, bereft of visions of squalid cells. There are echoes in local print and communal lyrics. The cacophony of this home has a neon gleam. For theirs is a world of disco lights and wantan min, bayside walks and the foamy sea, heels clutched 
from anxious feet. Kuala Lumpur to Houston, 1981. They say these streets were paved with aspiration. The ranches are far from our cul-de-sac. At church, the peace shows who arrived first. Dusty staircases nestle an ornamental clock. The ankung rests beside the piano and the swords above the organ. Turkey bones salt the chuk, and the stuffing is full of lap chung. These are burritos, not popia, skewers, not satay, but at least our names can remain the same. New York to Singapore, 1997. Marriage was an Episcopal church in a concrete borough, imagined in faded photos on a living room cupboard. In traded cityscapes emerge questions of what it means to taste perennial unease. For there is no continuity in sweat-stained uniforms and red-scratched booklets and stripe-smeared faces. Automated welcomes ring hollow, but the newscasters who bow and the billowing smoke and the whispers good night let me know that I'm home. Thank you very much. So this is uh, my poem. Five foundings, um, as mentioned, uh, each stanza really focuses on a different uh, point in history in which my family had to establish itself in a place. The first section, um, my family, or my on my mom's side, both my grandfather and grandmother were very proud of um, their Yangban heritage, which in kind of a Korean feudal social structure was the kind of politicians and scholars and both of my grandparents, you know, held very closely to that heritage and tried to instill that in my parents to the extent that they can try and sort of, or somewhere apparently in Korea, there's a document that includes um, all the information dating back to like 18 generations, supposedly. Um, so a lot of that uh, went into this first bit of the poem. The second bit refers to my dad's side. When my ancestors fled China for Malaya in 1900, at the time, there was a lot of social upheaval, there was famine, there was political unrest, and that was huge. there was huge downward pressure to move from China to different parts of Southeast Asia. And my great-great-grandparents -grand, great sailed from China to Malaya on a wooden junk and settled on the banks of a river in Malaya. Um, the third stanza sold to Hong Kong, um, 1969, this was um, my mom's childhood. So when my mom was about eight or nine, my haraboji, my grandfather, decided that he was going to uproot the entire family from Korea and move to Hong Kong. Um, there are a bunch of reasons um, that have been cited. One of them that I think I, I, I tried to include in the poem is this idea that because he was of that sort of... Um, bourgeois background. There was a bit of hostility uh, at the time because a lot of bourgeois people were collaborationists with Japanese colonists. And even though my grandfather was not, I think he was afraid that they were going to chuck him in prison by association. So it was fi he figured that it would be better to leave Korea for a little bit, which he eventually did, uh, even though my mom would return to Korea from Hong Kong for college. But it was in Hong Kong where I think my mom had her own experience of being part of the Korean diaspora you know, learning to speak English at school and Cantonese um, in day-to-day -day life in Hong Kong. And while there, my grandfather was very involved in the Korean community. He, you know, wrote the school anthem, the lyrics for the school anthem for the local Korean school. He uh, would, I don't know how he had the stamina, but he would single-handedly write out the Korean newspaper for the Korean community in Hong Kong. And they would eventually move back to Korea in about 2000. Um the fourth stanza, Kuala Lumpur to Houston, 1981. My grandparents uh, had decided for a variety of reasons, you know, state corruption and other family matters that they wanted to leave Malaysia for the U.S. So of all places, they settled on Houston, Texas, where they've been ever since. And I still have family in Houston and in Dallas. And uh, this portion is really about thinking about my grandparents migrating later in, in, in life and learning to reckon with all of these new cultural norms that they were encountering in Texas, which in the 80s was still very, not as, you know, Houston is quite a diverse city as we understand it now, but in the 1980s, it really wasn't. So I think they had their own sets of struggles and uh, reckonings with the American dream uh, and all of those aspirations that they took with them. Uh, but even though they moved to Houston, my dad did not actually follow them. My dad went to school 
graduated from college in England, worked in Singapore for a while, and then he moved to New York. And it was in New York where he met my mother, who was also uh, in school and working. Uh, they got to know one another. They got married. Um, they lived, continued living in New York for a couple more years. But the year after I was born, in 1997, they decided that they were going to move back to Asia. My dad had wanted to do business in Malaysia, but my mom wasn't keen on living there. So we ended up in Singapore instead, which is one hour uh, by flight, by plane from Kuala Lumpur. So growing up uh, here in Singapore, I didn't actually have any, well, not any, I didn't I have like a grand aunt and grand uncle, but other than that, no meaningful extended family. So I really grew up shuttling between here, Houston, Seoul, New York on occasion. Um, and I think a lot of these questions of belonging, these questions of heritage, these questions on where I was best situated, where I was most at home, these were questions that really beleaguered me as I was growing up. And I think there is an extent to which I, I still grapple with them. But you know, the flip side is that I, I, have, I can take comfort in knowing that my cousins who are you know, in my generation, we're all kind of scattered as well. A lot of us, um, my mom has five sisters and three of them married non-Koreans. So a bunch of us have this experience of being mixed as well. And I can kind of take comfort in knowing that I, I have family, you know, scattered as they may be, you know, in the US or in Korea, some in Europe, that we, this is something that we share and that we can relate to one another with. Um, and yeah, I think this poem was really just another way of trying to get to grips with the reasons that my ancestors made the decisions that they did to leave one place for another and how that has shaped my life today. So yeah, thank you again for listening and thank you Andre for taking this poem. Um, thank you for sharing. It was such a beautiful lyrical poem and I loved listening to you read it. Um, were there any questions for Jonathan before I delve, I guess? <laughs> Oh, there is one. Would you like to um mute? Oh, oops, oh, I should let that. Sorry, Neil or okay. Gavin. <laughs> well, I I was in your first stanza about Korea when you talk about words. Are you referencing the fact that the language Hangul uh, came about during that time as well, or was it just a reference to? Uh, your family's use. I mean, maybe they were writing in Chinese at that time, or what? What? What were the words that you were referencing in that first stanza? Referencing the yeah, word. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for the question. I think you're exactly right. 1418 is when Hangul was developed, um, and as we know, because King Sejong at the time wanted to encourage literacy among the common folk. Uh, as opposed to having literacy confined to the sort of Confucian scholar class, who are all operating in classical Chinese, which, you know, I've I've studied in school. It's it's so difficult. So yeah, those are the words that I, I was referring to, and partially because my uh, family traces its lineage back to King Sejong, who is known as the king who um, oversaw this linguistic reform. So it's one of those weird things, even though, you know, it doesn't necessarily have a bearing on where I am now, but it's one of those stories that my my parents and grandparents would would tell us in terms of where they saw their roots. So yeah, you're completely right. It's about Hangul. Well, wait a minute. Are you saying you're descended from King Sejong? Yeah, Is so that's why they've got those 18 generations of of records hidden somewhere in Korea. Supposedly, I mean, day to day, it doesn't really have any bearing but it's one of those things that was you know a big source of pride for my grandfather well yeah understandably <laughs> okay thank you no thank you for the question i had a question about that does your family have because i know my family used to have the book apparently like the family tree book that goes like in ancient interest do you one of your family members carry that type of book yeah, um, you know, anecdotally, I've heard that it's somewhere, but I don't actually know. I think, or I wonder, because my grandfather passed away about 12 years ago. So I wonder if it was him, you know, who was overseeing, the, you know, or, you know, caretaking um, for that. 
or if it's someone else. I, I really don't actually know. So a lot of it is just passed into oral history, maybe, for, just based on what I grew up hearing from my family. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Um, I had a question about how, um, so being, I mean, because both your parents are Asian though, right? I mean, they're both Asian. So I'm wondering why you felt extreme, because one of your comments in one of the IG comments, you had said that you have felt estranged from the sense of being Asian American in the past. Um, yeah. How do you identify, like you don't identify, you didn't used to identify as Asian American or? I, I think I was a little bit torn growing up. Um, I think, you know, on paper, uh, I was an Asian American, but I was growing up outside of the U.S. in Singapore. So I think that a lot of the struggle came with what it meant to identify as American or what obligations I had, if any. Um, but, you know, later took on a Singapore passport and that complicated things even more because I felt like, am I, you know, in taking on this new um, nationality, especially when American citizenship is so sought after, it's so highly desired, it's a huge privilege that left me feeling a lot of tension. And I think there's a part, and there still continues to be a part of me where I feel maybe because I grew up, up, grew up outside of America, only visiting you know, the summers and whatnot, whether or not I had a right to call myself Asian American. So I think that's where I, I've fallen on a little bit, but you know, I was back in the US for grad school, um, 2021 to 2022. And while I was there, I think I some of these questions, some of these, struggles faded away a little bit because I got to spend a lot of time with my Korean American cousins who were there about to be part of some Asian American friendship uh, friend groups uh, when I was in school and I think it kind of helped to relieve me of, of the burn a little bit like I didn't have to feel the sense that I had to disavow the fact that I was an Asian American so that's kind of where I've landed and but you know my because of how complicated my, my family story is I there's a part where it's just, you know, I'm, I'm at the middle of all of these different intersections and it's fine because the flip side is that it allows, it has allowed me to use those different memories of where my family has been to connect with people from those who call those different places home. And your mom is currently in, in New York right now, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, what are your plans to, um, are you, for the foreseeable future, you'll be in Singapore for a couple more years. Yeah, yeah, I, I got a job here. I do some research at a think tank. Um, but, you know, continue writing, continue thinking. I've actually had a bunch of poems I've been writing, still thinking about Korean diaspora questions, but in a more expansive or broad way. So one poem that I've written is dedicated to Young Il Kang, who was the first Korean or even Asian American novelist in the U.S. who published, uh, you know, two novels. The second of which was called *East Goes West* in the 1930s, which is, you know, was an incredible discovery for me. Um, another poem that I've written about recently um, was uh, dedicated to this uh, this man in the U.S. called Milton Washington, and he wrote this memoir called *Slicky Boy*. I'm not sure if people have heard of it. This is a really incredible story about how he was born in Korea. His mother was a sex worker and his father was an African-American GI, but the father left because he was recalled by the US military. He, he and his mom were kicked out of their village because it was believed that a black child would bring misfortune to the village. So they lived in a bunch of different cities in Korea. And one day she dropped him off at an orphanage and he never saw her again. He was later adopted by a black father and mother and he moved to the US and he's now, as he's aged, he's begun to record some of these memories that he had of growing up in Korea. Um, you know, he got involved in like, you know, some tomfoolery, stealing candy and, and all that kind of stuff. And then eventually his journey to the US and, you know, the erosion of his Korean identity is, you know, even though he was speaking Korean until he was nine or 10 after he was adopted and he moved to the US and he was at this promised land where black people are from, you know, so he was no longer an outsider in the way he felt in, he was in Korea. Um, he, he lost his Korean and he, you know, became 
fully you know caught fluent in English and and so that was another person that I was really fascinated by um you know it's kind of the tragedy of his story I was writing a poem about his life as well so you know some continuing um, thinking about this question of being Korean American or being part of the Korean diaspora and and this question of roots yeah Thank you for sharing, Jonathan. I'm going to open up the forum now. If um, Youngie, and I don't know if Yunsu is still around because I know she had to go to the airport, but um, yeah. And if anybody want to have um, any additional questions, hi, Yunsu, I'm still here. Or if you guys want to, if you just want to open it up and we just talk, talk to each other, <laughs> and I'll keep the chat chat box open for anyone yeah did we already discuss Kyungi? did you want to i know um i had not finished we didn't discuss what was coming up for you or um because i i know i had your slideshow on but yeah you have you have a book released recently right yeah, so I have a children's poetry book out now as of April um, called See Us Bloom and you can buy it anywhere. Um, and that is, that's inspired by my nephew, who is Korean, Jewish, American, and a little bit about my journey as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And then, you know, and I continue to write poems. I... Um, and I would love to um, have a short short stories, essays, or a poetry collection um, out. One of them being a chat book on exploring the immigrant body. Um, yeah, so constantly just writing my poems. But yeah, all the inf info can be found on my website. Great. Thank you. And Yunsu, did you get a chance to drop in your link for your next event? Or do you want me to do that for you? I'll do that right now <laughs> before I forget. <laughs> I just wanted to remind you. And then also, um, yeah, I'll, I'll also drop a link about um, if you guys want to have future. I know the show at the Aborn Gallery at AS220 is having a closing reception this Saturday. In the address is 95 Empire Street, second floor. Um, and the closing reception is from 3 to 5 p.m. And the artists JP and Dahe Yang and um, the writer Karis Yu will be reading and performing that night, that evening, I guess that afternoon. Sorry, it's going to be around between 3 and 5 p.m. And that'll be the closing of the group exhibition, but we'll still have the book, which will live on. <laughs> Yay. And hopefully everyone, oh, well, except for Jonathan, because I haven't mailed it to, but it's, it's, let me know, Jonathan, when your mother gets it in New York <laughs> on its safe arrival, but yeah, you got it, can you? Yay. And this can also be seen at the group exhibition until Saturday. Oh, and Lynn is online as well. Hi, Lynn. You want to say a few words? Lynn is also um, in the book. She's zooming in from, from New York. Hi. I, I, did, I couldn't fit her in the Zoom talk because it, it was going to run over for an hour for sure. But oh, thank you, Yunsu, for dropping that link. Oh, and thank you, Neil. Great. I know everybody's on it. <laughs> oh, oh, this is great. It says Ty and JP are online as well. Show your faces. I want to see your faces. Where are you? <laughs> Everyone's hiding their faces. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. He sent a... Um, he dropped a link for his WordPress link. Oh, and I should send a link. Um, here, I'll send a link to the Booty account in case people are interested in following us for future events. Maybe there will be one. Maybe Lynn can do a, a reading in New York. 
like we had planned, right? Something in New York. Maybe we could do a reading there in the future. So this is our Instagram account. And also, I'll also drop a link to um, purchasing the book. Currently, it's on a sliding scale um, pricing for the month of May during Asian Heritage Month. And yeah, if there's any more questions or comments, do you guys want to say anything? Last chance. <laughs> Lynn, did you want to say something? Say a few words? Promoting your, your um, I know we don't have time to read the entire section, but Lynn is a Korean adoptee. Um, and she contributed a significant portion of the book on a, sh a small, a short story. Um, hi, I, I don't actually need to talk about that. <laughs> I I just actually, I just wanted to comment on the Han discussion because yeah. I, I, lo I loved, I, I loved this whole evening. Thank you, uh, Andre for organizing. Um, but I, I was thinking actually a lot about Han and just over the years. And, um, I, I actually feel like when I first learned what what it meant I I felt very validated like I was like because I always felt I mean I'm a Korean adoptee so I grew up with no Korean anything and um I I I kind of was always searching for like proof that I came from Korea so any anytime I would be like oh I know what Han is because I feel it and so that means I'm Korean. <laughs> like, like I will take that, even though, you know, I didn't grow up with Korean parents or a family or anything. So it it feels it because I just like I I'm very like uh like I love grief, I love like sadness, I love like all the negative emotions that we're not supposed to talk about. It it comes out in my writing. And so it just felt I don't know. Like I, I am, I am Korean just because, you know, I understand the Han, like the Han is in my blood somehow. So that felt good. So anyway. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lynn. I mean, have you heard of this experience? When was, when did you first encounter the word Han? Um, I mean, I feel like I've heard about it uh, like in my twenties. So, and I, I remember hearing Jong for the first time and really not understanding that concept either, but I, I would say Han is more like I more recently in now that I'm, I'm writing and I'm, I'm really kind of exploring that more. Um, I, I just feel it more and I, I'm watching a lot of Korean dramas and I'm just, I'm just like, I yeah I that's another essay but yeah I know thank you for sharing Lynn and do you have anything um yeah I know you have tons of ideas for for new work I'm sure uh, oh oh sorry Yunsu I know I understand thank you for joining us Bye, Yunsu. Thank you for everything. It was nice meeting everyone too, work on the project. So it was really great. Thank you for organizing everything. No problem. No, I'm so glad we did this. And yeah, if, if um, yeah, in the future, maybe we should just do groups of three and, and do more, more virtual talks. Um, you know, I did it for this month for, for like, you know, the exhibition at AST20, but yeah, we could continue having talks in the future too. Thank you so much. Um, if no one has anything else to add, I'd like to thank the staff, Neil and Gabby for being tech assistants and monitors. Thank you so much. And they were wonderful in, in installing the show. Um, and yeah, I hope if anyone is nearby on the East Coast to join us at the closing reception Saturday, May 27th at the Aborn. And I think Neil had dropped in all the details on the chat as well. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.